Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we are ringing in the new year with the storied gray stuff from Beauty and the Beast, which I thought, oh, I thought this might be have food under it. I guess we have to make it. Now, I know the folks at Disney said to their animator, Frank, just draw us a plate of appetizers, okay? Nobody is going to agonize over it 30 years later on a big TV trying to figure out what each element is. So just put some appetizers on there. We don't care if they don't make sense. So anyway, over here we have a mystery tea sandwich. I think it might be some kind of fig spread, maybe with some goat cheese or something. That'd be cool. Then up here we've got some salmon mousse with a cucumber and what I think is a buckwheat blini. Then we got ourselves a pig in a blanket, no mistake in that. Then over here I have no earthly idea what this is. Again, I think Frank was just like, I'm gonna keep my head down, do my job. Michael Eisner is not gonna fire me. Not today. I have a pension to think about. Then up here we've got a cucumber tea sandwich, pretty simple. Then down here I think we've got some salmon roe on top of another buckwheat blini. Definitely not my favorite. Then we got a little roll of meat with what looks like a little strip of cheese and maybe some roasted peppers on top. And then finally, the gray stuff. Pictured here twice which has been erroneously reported and maliciously marketed as some kind of cookies and cream red velvet cupcake nonsense. But this is a tray of hors d'oeuvres. What we got here is most likely foie gras or chicken liver mousse. I'm going with the latter because I don't want people to get mad at me. So I'm patting dry about half a pound of chicken livers and then finally mincing one shallot and a little bit of fresh thyme, maybe a teaspoon worth. And then we are headed over to the stove top where we are preheating a little bit of vegetable oil over medium high heat until shimmering, adding the chicken livers and letting sit undisturbed for one to two minutes until they are nice and browned on one side. Give them a little flip so they can start browning on the other side, and we're going to add our shallots and thyme. Saute together for another minute just to let those flavors get to know each other a little bit, and then we're going to deglaze with maybe a quarter cup of cognac. If you have a fire extinguisher nearby and you know what you're doing, go ahead and flame this if you like, but it doesn't really do anything for the flavor. It's kind of just for showboating. And now that the livers are brown on the outside and pink on the inside, I'm going to add the zest of half a lemon. Kill the heat, let it cool down for like 30 seconds, and then add a quarter cup of heavy cream. Swirl it around a little bit just to make sure that everybody's acquainted and then it's time to head over to an awaiting blender or food processor into which we are going to deposit the contents of our pan. Then we're going to crank the blender on a medium low speed and one chunk at a time add one and one half sticks of unsalted butter. Yeah that's a lot of butter but this is also going to be a lot of delicious. So once all the butter is added we're going to crank this thing on high and blend it until very very smooth and then we're going to pass it through a fine mesh strainer to catch any little bits. And there you have it chicken liver mousse and we need to cover it with the plastic wrap pressed down onto to the surface of the mousse because that's how this stuff becomes gray when it oxidizes. So next up we're going to make some salmon mousse. I'm starting with about three, four ounces of smoked salmon to which I'm going to add the juice of one half of one lemon and four ounces or half a bar of Neufchatel cheese because that feels a little bit more French and appropriate but it's virtually identical to cream cheese so you can just go ahead and use cream cheese if you want. Puree until smooth and mousse-like and then we're going to cover that and refrigerate until ready to use it. Next up are pigs and mystery objects in a blanket. I'm going to go with dates. They're similar brown, kind of craggly, and they're a really nice appetizer when you stuff them with blue cheese. Then normally you'd wrap them in bacon before roasting, but puff pastry is going to be a nice substitute if you want to keep it vegetarian, I guess. So then it's time to bust out the puff, roll it out a little bit on a generously floured worktop, and then we're slicing them into maybe three inch long triangles, which we can then roll around our cocktail wieners and blue cheese stuffed dates, starting at the broad side and sealing with a little bit of egg wash if it's not sticking together. Regardless, we are brushing everybody down with a little bit of egg wash for presentation sake, and I'm going to sprinkle everybody with a little bit of kosher salt, both for flavor and presentation, and then we're going to roast for about 20 minutes at 375 or until browned and puffed. Next up, we got to make ourselves some buckwheat blinis in a large bowl. I'm combining 75 grams of all-purpose flour, 60 grams of buckwheat flour, 15 grams of sugar, and 5 grams of yeast. I'm just going to whisk those to combine using regular-sized whisk, and then I'm adding one cup of whole milk heated to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The warm milk is going to give our yeast a little bit of a boost, and at this point, I'm going to add a little pinch of salt and then gently whisk until smooth. Now this is basically a yeasted pancake batter, so we need to let it rest for an hour. Covered with plastic wrap at room temperature so that yeast can munch down on that sugar. An hour later and you should see that your batter has doubled in volume and at this point we're going to add some eggs. We're going to try to crack one, fail miserably, ponder how we managed to make this our full-time job as we fish out all the shell fragments, add a second egg, and then lightly beat them together before pouring directly into the batter. In addition, we're also going to add two tablespoons of melted butter. Make sure it's not hot, just melted. We do not want to scramble those eggs and then we're going to whisk until everybody's homogenous, smooth, and incorporated, and then pour the whole affair into a large squeeze bottle. This is going to make making tiny pancakes a lot 
lot easier. Go ahead and demonstrate it on your countertop for some reason. Perfect. And make sure you don't overfill your bottle or this is going to happen. It's a yeasted batter and it's going to expand. Anyway, once we got that all cleaned up, it's time to make some blinis, which are essentially silver dollar pancakes. And as is the case with all pancakes, the first batch is going to look weird. But as you make batch after batch, you will soon find yourself flipping perfect panners. It's the life lesson universal to all pancakes. Never give up. Once the pancakes are done cooking, about a minute on each side, I'm going to place them onto a paper towel just to cool off a bit before we serve. Now onto those little meat roll things. I think you can use pretty much any charcuterie that you want. I'm going with mortadella because it's my favorite. I know it's not French, but sorry. And then I'm going to wrap it with an ultra thin slice of Gruyere. Top it with some tiny little slices of roasted red pepper and skewer with a toothpick. And there you have it. Definitely the easiest appetizer of the bunch and maybe my favorite. Whoops, shoot, where'd it go? Need to make another one. And now onto the tea sandwiches. I'm just arranging some thinly sliced cucumbers, a smear of Neufchatel cheese, and fresh dill. Then we're slicing off the crusts and cutting into neat little tea sandwiches. Next up, the goat cheese and fig one. I just have some goat cheese here and some fig jam. Simple enough, I think it went a little bit too heavy on the goat cheese there, but now it's time for the assembled platter. Been waiting to do this for a long time. Be our guest. All right, so let's go through and try all these. First, the little blue cheese dates puff pastry thing. And this is pretty good. It's actually a lot less rich than the bacon version, and I kind of like it. Next up, pig in a blanket. Tale as old as time. And huge shocker, it's really good. Next up, we got us some salmon mousse with cucumber on a blini. And it's pretty nice. I mean, I wouldn't order it in a restaurant, but I'd certainly eat it. Now we got some fig and goat cheese. And this one's pretty good. I think I went too heavy with the goat cheese, but if you went a little bit more restrained with it, you'd have a very good tea sandwich. Then let's get rid of this inappropriate olive on the cucumber tea sandwich and this guy is a home run. Just maybe add a little bit of kosher salt during the assembly process. Mortadella roll, winner. Now I don't have to eat this salmon roe to know that I'm gonna hate it, but I am a food recreation scientist and I have an obligation. And finally, the gray stuff. Let's do a finger taste like Belle did, really good. And it can definitely use a more robust cracker, the prettier piping, but you heard it here, folks. The gray stuff, the real gray stuff, is delicious. Mm -hmm.